As the Industrial Revolution reached its height in the 19th century, it generated vast wealth and brought unprecedented change across the land. But not all its effects were benign or beneficial, and the ensuing massive growth in population soon outstripped the capacity of a social infrastructure that for centuries had been geared to little more than rural life. A water supply system based on simple pumps and wells was wholly inadequate, and it was inevitable that waterborne diseases should take hold. Most serious of these was cholera, which in 1832, in Bilston alone, killed 20% of the population and forced graveyards to close through lack of space. A solution was needed, and quickly. But what measures could be taken? Who would implement them? And would they succeed? Writer and broadcaster Graham Fisher finds out. This is the recorded sound of a Bolton and Watts steam engine and its near hypnotic rhythm of valve gears as it pumps water around a labyrinth of pipes. Now a rarity, it was a common backdrop in numerous applications around the black country and beyond during the Industrial Revolution. I'm standing on the ground floor in a building in Lichfield, Staffordshire, a magnificent assemblage of blue bricks with polychromatic red and yellow brick dressings and stone sills that was of sufficient architectural merit to be commented on by architectural scholar Nikolaus Pevsner. It is still home to a magnificent engine that is currently inoperable, but which once sang in similar fashion to the one we just heard. This is Sandfield's pumping station, part of a grand scheme to bring fresh water to people of the black country. With me is David Moore, postgraduate reader in public history and currently chairman of Litchfield Waterworks Trust, a group dedicated to saving the now disused pumping station. We'll explore this fascinating building more in due course, but first, can we set the scene by describing the extent of water pollution that was being experienced by black country towns in general and when it first became a problem with diseases like cholera? How did cholera arise and spread? Cholera is a relatively new disease. It really appeared in Britain in about 1831. Its origins were probably the Bay of Bengal in India, where it was an endemic disease. What were the principal causes of it? Contaminated water. With the advent of the Industrial Revolution, once the population started to move, it brought back cholera with it from the Bay of Bengal. It spread across Europe, up into Russia, and people in Britain knew it was coming. And there was nothing they could do about it. There was no known cause, and there was no known cure. The black country was significantly affected purely because of the density of the population. The Industrial Revolution brought people out of the countryside into the black country and there was no supportive infrastructure whatsoever. Towns like Tipton, since the onset of the Industrial Revolution, had always had water shortage problems. And that was really due to the industrial processes themselves were using lots of water. The industrial processes were polluting the watercourses and the wells. And the overuse of water was reducing the levels of water in the wells themselves. People in Tipton were actually drinking the canal water to such a degree that the canal companies were complaining that they couldn't get the barges down the cut. So what were the uh, effects of such diseases like cholera? The disease started on the 4th of August, 1832. It was a very aggressive, indiscriminate disease that was very rapid in its onset. People would become ill and within hours their body would start to turn blue. They would have incredibly severe stomach pains and then the diarrhea would start and within six weeks in Tipton alone there were 742 people dead. They couldn't bury people quick enough, there was insufficient coffins, several people from the same families were dying all at once, people were told to sort of whitewash the walls, not to drink alcohol and things like that but nobody could actually locate what the actual source of the contagion was. And that was absolutely sort of terrifying because if we look at diseases like Ebola, 800 people died in three years and that caused a lot of terror. 
in Tipton alone, you know, nearly 800 people died in six weeks. It was obviously incredibly infectious. So uh, presumably there must have been special provisions at, for example, burial sites. It was difficult because it's known as a filth disease. You can imagine that put somebody who's died, probably passing between three and five gallons of diarrhoea in a day. They must be in a terrible state and people were fearful of the corpses. There was no refrigeration. There was no embalming. It was in the middle of summer. The place must have been hell on earth with people dying. And so corpses were literally piling up in people's parlours. So how did cholera rate, if I can put it that way, in the hierarchy of diseases? How serious was it compared with the others? What were the others? Other diseases were things like typhoid and smallpox, which we understood, you know, with smallpox, we had got strategies to avoid catching smallpox or we would take measures to immunise ourselves against smallpox. With cholera, it was sort of new, it was out of the blue, and it was incredibly rapid. So people just did not know what to do next. And I think that was the problem with this. It had just got this fur factor that they didn't know how it was being spread or how you're going to catch it. But cholera was an incredibly serious, debilitating disease. And even the people who didn't die quite often were quite debilitated afterwards. But we're talking about cholera, particularly in epicentres like Bilston and Tipton. Yet here we are standing in the middle of Litchfield in Staffordshire, some dozen or so miles away from that area. So describe the uh, means that were put in place to deal with the problem, why we're here in Litchfield and why we're standing in this absolutely magnificent pump house. It was actually John Snow in London who made the link between cholera and contaminated drinking water. And I think once John Snow had established that link, it was really down to individual entrepreneurs and philanthropists who established a need for an organised water supply. Dougley did attempt to set up a waterworks, but it wasn't really a very successful endeavour. And I think that was also mainly due to the fact that the black country itself, because it's quite high ground and because it was heavily industrialised, it hadn't really got an adequate source of clean water. Now Litchfield, 11 miles away, has. Litchfield's had a source of water since the 13th century, an organised water supply. It was called the Conduits Land Trust. And the Conduits Land Trust is still in existence today. What the Conduits Land Trust did was it took water from Aldershaw, some springs, and piped it about a mile into Litchfield. So the actual town itself got a pretty adequate water supply. In fact, it was so adequate, there was actually a spare water supply. And when the engineers visited Litchfield, they established that the Lemons and Lynn Truckfield Brook had probably got about one and a half million gallons of actually clean, drinkable water ready on tap. And what it wanted was an organised water scheme to bring this water together and then get it over to the black country. And we're standing in the building that achieved that. Would you describe it to us briefly, what we're standing in now? It's a blue brick building. This particular building was built in 1974. Inside it is a Cornish beam engine. It's probably about the fourth largest Cornish beam engine that was ever built. The building is about 45 feet tall, but it also extends about 70 to 80 feet under where we're standing as well. What we're actually seeing is really just a small part of a massive infrastructure. So to shift water from Litchfield um, to impounding reservoirs had to be built. Huge task. Yeah, so absolutely huge task. who were some of the key people that drove it forward? The key person who really drove this forward was a chap called John McLean. John McLean uh, was an engineer. He was involved in building the Suez Canal. He was involved in building some of the docks in London. Some people write McLean as highly as we write Brunel. McLean owned some of the collieries at Cannock, and he became the sole owner of the Litchfield to Warsaw Railway, which is the actual railway track that runs right outside this building. And by becoming owner of that railway, it gave him the financial resources to put up his own money to start this scheme and to get this scheme on the road. So he funded it? So he partially funded it with a group of other people, that's correct. It's a huge building as we described, uh, but there was more to it than just the building. What did the entire project involve? Okay, so the extent of the works? So the actual entire project was first of all to enlarge the two lakes in the town centre. That's Minsterpool and Stowpool. So Minsterpool used to pick up all the dregs from the cathedral close. It was basically an open sewer. So that all had to be cleaned out. Apparently when they cleaned it out, they discovered thousands of cannonballs from the Civil War. 
stove pool was enlarged by about three times the size it was. It was a little small mill pond. And they also increased the depth of it by about 15 feet by building a dam at the far end. This then had to be connected together by a combination of a pipeline and then a three quarter mile tunnel that ran under the central Litchfield right down to below where we're actually standing. Then an 11 mile pipeline had to be built from here to Warsaw. And then a further impounding reservoir was built in Moat End at Warsaw. The engines, because there was more than one I understand, four in total. Just standing by the main one here, this is engine number four. And the connecting rods on the valve gears are several yards long. It's an enormous piece of uh, kit. How on earth did they get it here? It was constructed in Tipton by a local iron founder called John and George Davis. They built particularly large engines. They built a number for the Birmingham Water Works Company. So they were good at building these very large engines. And it was bought out on horse and carting pieces. But some of the single pieces were over 20 tonnes. And it was all hand-balled in. In fact, what they did is the window there was actually built wider. This is the window behind us on the ground floor? That's right, yeah. So that window was built wider and things were dragged in through the window and then the window was bricked back up again. So as then the building was built, the engine became part of the building, so you can't separate the two. Let's uh, continue our conversation from another part of the building, David. Uh, okay. Let's go to the first floor, shall we? Excellent. There's a big round thing here, about 10 feet across, looks like a, a huge brewing vessel in a brewery or distillery. What is this? Okay, so this is the actual steam cylinder. So this steam cylinder is 65 inches in diameter. And this is basically the powerhouse where all the power is developed to operate the pump. And adjacent to that, it's uh, what appears to be valve gear. That's right, so next to it you've got the valve chest and you've got a row of valves, the inlet valve the equilibrium valve, and the one on the end is called the governor. Adjacent to that is a cylinder lubricator that kept the inside of the engine all lubricated. Looking up through a gap into the upper floor, there's a, an enormous cast iron beam there. I'm going to ask you to describe what that is. That's the actual beam, hence the term beam engine. The beam is about 24 feet long and it weighs over 20 tonnes. It was cast in two halves, so they're assembled in the factory, then bought it in one piece and pulled up through the window onto this top floor. Amazing. The engine itself operated at about seven strokes per minute and it would lift water a ton at a time up the 70 foot deep shaft. It would then pump the water away through a force pump 11 miles all the way to Warsaw, 350 feet higher so that's an average vertical distance of almost 400 feet. Now this piston you're talking about in the cylinder, just the bit protruding has got to be 12 feet high out at the top of the cylinder. And it's lifting stuff up from a huge distance underground. There must have been a, a tremendous clatter going on here. A, a that noise. That's actually where people are mistaken. These engines, they were so efficient that they ran actually almost silently. So you would hear the sort of click of the valves as the valves triggered the cycle. So it, it, it operated on a water clock called a cataract. Once the cataract triggered, you'd hear the sort of valves go click, click, click. And then you'd hear a, a gentle wash of steam and the whole lot would just sort of move down. And you'd hear the wind of the machinery sort of passing by your ear if you're standing by it. But it was actually incredibly quiet. But these pistons are absolutely enormous. What stops them at the bottom of the stroke? Nothing. The science behind operating the engine is so sophisticated that the engine is able to stop purely on steam pressure itself. And it stops with an inch and a half at the bottom of the cylinder, just purely on steam pressure. It's then released and the water that it's being pumped slows down the stroke in the opposite direction. That must have been cutting edge technology that was made. It was at the time, if you imagine I described this place as this is like the technology that drove the space shuttle. If you place it into today's context, it's like a 40 ton juggernaut accelerating from naught to 40 mile an hour in about 1.7 seconds and then coming to a stop in about one second within an inch and a half. That's how sophisticated the technology was. That is quite amazing, isn't it? it? Is. We mentioned uh, earlier Nikolaus Pevsner, the architectural scholar, being impressed by this building. I wonder if he actually got to see inside and saw what we're looking at now, these 
beautiful arches that seem to have no function other than just being put there for their beauty. And even parts of the mechanisms are beautifully shaped and contrived. There seems no rhyme or reason to it in terms of functionality. Why were they built like this? The designers were actually making a statement. So they almost used the language from the past to describe a way to the future. So they designed these sort of beautiful Tuscan arches, the fluted columns, the very intricate detail on the parallel motion. They struggled to raise money for these waterworks, but if they could sort of make a bold statement that we are taking public health seriously, this is a scheme that's going to be here for hundreds of years, that actually would encourage investors to cough up their money to invest in the waterworks. So they're making these statements about longevity, about how they care. And sometimes they're actually making a statement about themselves. There surely must have been other inputs than pure engineering expertise to create such a work of art. There certainly was. I mean, the building itself was designed by Edward Adams, and Edward Adams actually designed a number of very beautiful local buildings. St Anne's Church in Chastown. He designed the two stations, both at Walsall and Lichfield. He designed Walsall Grammar School. And again, he designed it with sort of beauty and making this very sort of bold statement in mind. And if he designed churches, then that uh, may well account for these magnificent arch windows as well. Absolutely, yes. The public response to it all in its day, David, how was it greeted? The actual public themselves um, were quite enthusiastic because they were going to get clean water. So did it suffer any hostile reactions from any quarters? It did. They generally were either rival companies or rival individuals. So the Earl of Lichfield complained because basically he felt that this pumping station would be robbing the water from his mills that he owned, which were at the far side of Stopal. Agreement was reached with him. He was paid compensation. The $64,000 question, I think, is how did it save lives or even change lives in the black country that it was destined to serve? Well, the end result was that after a number of cholera epidemics, 1832, 1848, 1856, 1866, cholera eventually disappeared from Great Britain. But Sandfields, when it was originally built, was a pumping station rather than a treatment plant for treating polluted water. So why was this so successful? I presume it was down to the fact that it was pumping cleaner water. Is, is it as simple as that? Absolutely correct, yes. I mean, the water at Litchfield was perfectly clean and pure and drinkable because there was no industrialisation in Litchfield. The problem the black country had got was people were polluting their own water. So when people became ill with cholera, they got diarrhoea, that diarrhoea would find its way into a completely inadequate sewage system, it would find its way back into the water supply, people would then drink that contaminated water and it would then contaminate dozens of other people. So it was effectively self-perpetuating? It was self-perpetuating. And that's what happened when John Snow did his research. John Snow managed to isolate the Broadwater pump was down to one family. And what was happening was the head of the household became ill with cholera. The wife was washing his clothes. The water from the sink was running into a cesspit. The cesspit had got a crack in it. Water from the cesspit was then seeping into the well, into the pump. And then the people who were taking water from that pump were just being contaminated and dying. When the man in the household died, the cholera epidemic actually started to subside. But then a baby in the same household became ill. So the cycle started again. Sandfields was uh, successful purely on the basis of pumping clean water to the black country for people to drink. So were the effects immediate or did it take time for it to it, all kick in? It took time because the whole undertaking was massive. It was really over a period of about 20 years. Mm -hmm. This itself, you know, this infrastructure was two years in its construction. It was then extended. And although we could get water to Warsaw, that water had to be then distributed from Warsaw all the way across the black country. Year by year, more and more villages were brought online. It was an incredibly long-term vision. And that actual vision started from day one when this pumping station was built because they knew that once this comes online, there would be a demand. So when this was built, they built it a provision to increase its capacity. In fact, they built in provisions to double its capacity. And that capacity was doubled in 1974. Was it only ever a, a pumping station? It was built originally as a waterworks and it pumped untreated water. 
However, because the scheme was so successful and it was servicing more and more people, the demands for cleaner water came about. So in 1927, adjacent to the building, South Stas Water built a water treatment works. The pumping station then pumped the water into the water treatment works where the water treatment works mixed the water with the combination of sawdust and alum and that caused the solids to precipitate out. The water was then run through eight foot of sand and out the bottom came this sort of beautifully clean sparkling drinking water. The water was then chlorinated, pumped back into the pumping station and then the pumping station would then pump it back to the Black Country 11 miles. Sadly, it came to an end eventually. What replaced the pumping station? What, what led to its decline? Once Sandfields was completed and running, other pumping stations were added, Brindley Bank, Maple Brook, Maple Hayes, Ashwood pumping station. So there's been a period of continual growth, serving more and more customers, getting more and more water. What started happening in Litchfield was the water levels in Litchfield were starting to get alarmingly low. The groundwater itself was becoming alarmingly low and the environmental agency was getting a little bit concerned that the Lemsey Brook was actually drying up. And because Sastas Water had obtained a new water supply at Blithfield Reservoir where it was tapping into the River Blythe and it's built this huge reservoir, it also started to extract water from the River Severn which has got an abundant water supply it felt that it could actually abandon this station and so it ceased pumping from here in about 1997. What's happened to it in the interim since its closure? So staff's on gone to the buildings. They had like a sort of tentative attempt to convert it to a little bit of a workshop in the 1960s building but that didn't really sort of add anything to the value of South Staff's water. So South Staff's decided to sell the site in 2005 to a housing developer the housing developer needed access to some farmland. South Staff's made provision in the sale documents to say that the developer must reasonably maintain the pumping station and then donate the pumping station to a charitable trust that's got to be adequately funded. Also, whilst building the estate, the council, obviously concerned with its heritage, inserted a section 106 clause into the development to say that the developer should maintain the building. So all this has um, helped preserve it in its current state. To my untrained eye, it looks in not too bad condition. How would you describe it? It's looking nice now, but the trust has actually put a significant amount of work in. The trust being the Litchfield Waterworks Trust, That's which correct. I'll come on to shortly. Yeah. But uh, yeah. just tell me what the current significance of this building is, David, why it has to be conserved. It's a cathedral to the Industrial Revolution. It's a grade two star listed building that makes it above, you know, specialist interest. Inside here with the curved windows yeah. and the uh, gap through the floors and the polychromatic bricks, it yeah. actually looks a bit like a cathedral. It does, doesn't it? That's right, you know. It's a piece of our industrial heritage. People now are beginning to recognise that our industrial heritage has played a significant part in the economic development of Great Britain. And people also now are developing a new relationship with industrial heritage. You know, people are understanding that their parents, their grandparents, you know, their great-grandparents worked in industry. And by understanding the work they did in industry, it helps us today to get our own sense of identity. When we understand what our ancestors did for a living, what their values were, what their interests were, you know, what the job they physically did on the ground were, how much they were paid, that adds a piece of life to your family tree. We've got this extensive archive. We can tell people how much their grandfather earned in a year, what their job was. We can even tell them what the colour of their uniform was. So there's that sort of social side of this pumping station. And I think the other side of this pumping station is tens of thousands of people died of cholera. A lot of those people were buried in mass graves in cholera pits. And there's no monument to their lives. And this Pompey station gives them people back a voice so that we can start to tell their story. So you're looking at the tangibility of this building as a link to the social history of absolutely. the past and the present indeed. Yeah, absolutely. You know, with this massive archive, you look at it and it oozes skill, doesn't it? You know, the Black Country Iron Founders, they produce some of the most beautiful iron work in the world. And it's a testament to their skills. What are the trust's aims and objectives? What do you hope to achieve? The covenant that's 
was written and agreed with the developer and the Section 106 agreement says that the building has to be donated to a charitable trust. So it was prudent for us to set a trust up in readiness for that donation to be made. Now, our aims and objectives of a trust are to preserve this building in perpetuity. So we've got a piece of the past that we can take forward into the future. What we believe is that this building was built to serve the community and it did, it served it remarkably well and we believe that it should continue to serve the community in maybe a different cause. So, we're standing in the 1874 building. It's a magnificent space just to be in here. We've also got this additional space in the 1960s building. We would like to see that might be refurbished as a community centre, an art centre, a place for people just to meet, you know. I'd be very surprised if you're not going to see this engine working again. Well, that's again, actually one of our aims. We'd like to get the engine working again. No end of interpretation panels is ever going to live up to seeing this thing move. When they move, they are just magnificent. It looks quite intact. It doesn't it, look like it would need much work on it to get it going again. There's a lot of technical challenges to get it going, but it could be got going because at the end of the day, um, Sir Stas had the foresight in 1927 to say, this needs preserving. And so they very carefully packaged it up and prepared it for long-term storage for us. You know. So it was just uh, stopped in its tracks, as it, it were, not, to, not, not broken down in any way. That's right, it was stopped in its tracks. Sad staffs appreciated the heritage value of this building, and it was kept in a state of preservation right up until, you know, 2005. You're a membership of the Trust, the personnel. What's the catchment area? What skills do they bring to the organisation, and uh, how do they contribute to your resources? As far as we're concerned, anybody who's shown an interest joins us. We don't require special skills. What we do do is we train people. So we have put 15 members on a health and safety course. Two weeks ago we put 12 people on a first aid course. We've put four people on a preservation of large museum objects course that was actually laid on by the Manchester Museum of Technology. What we say is if you can come here and say to a visitor, welcome to Sandfields Pompey Station, you've got the job. So uh, how can people help you and uh, how can they join your organisation? They can visit our website where we've got a membership form. Membership is free. If they want to make a donation, they can, but that's not compulsory. We uh, appreciate that people have got you know, various means of income. And also we appreciate you know, that people have got varying states of ability and disability. And in fact, one of our members is actually a wheelchair user. You know, so it's probably the first wheelchair user to actually enter this building in 160 years. Many thanks to you, David. That's David Moore, Chairman of Litchfield Waterworks Trust. But I'll leave the final word to the Reverend William Lee, who in September 1832 wrote, and I quote, the condition of Bilston had become frightful. The pestilence was literally sweeping everything before it, neither age nor sex nor station escaping. To describe the consternation of the people is impossible. Manufactories are closed and business completely at a stand. It is thanks to the likes of Sandfields Pumping Station that within a few years of the Reverend Lee offering those observations, cholera had been virtually eliminated from the black country and was similarly in retreat across the rest of the land. And while still a serious problem across many parts of the world, it remains to this day virtually unknown in the UK. You can find out more about Graham Fisher's exploration of the history of the black country at our website at www.historywm.com, where you can also download articles revealing the enthralling story of the people who made the region into Britain's industrial powerhouse.